I want to thank you all for allowing me to be here with you to share some of my poetry today. Everything I'll be reading today is from uh, my most recent book called Work is Love Made Visible, which was published by Albuquerque's own West End Press. And the first poem is the title poem of the collection. Work is Love Made Visible. After working all day at home or at the garment factory, or taking care of her mother or her grandchildren, after cooking dinner and cleaning up the kitchen, my granny would uncover her sewing machine and stitch our family together. Her love for me is a green paisley dress with a matching purse, constructed when I was eight and tucked into bed in the next room, the sewing machine humming into my dreams. Her love for me is a 1970s high fashion three-piece suit, bell-bottom pants, vest, blazer with broad lapels, made of faux suede patchwork in orange and brown. Even now, I can recite every article of Granny's handiwork, proclaim the delight of something made just for me, sing the alchemy of love and labor, testify that after working all day, day after day, my Granny would sit at her sewing machine and attire me in vestments of love. This poem is conviction, and I'm going to do it anyway. It's for my husband, Kieran, who's here today. Conviction. To the topmost branch of the cedar tree that has lost most of its limbs to one storm or another, the mockingbird has returned. He swings with delight on the supple branch as it bends and sways in the gusty March wind. He chortles his song and everyone else's and answers my out of tune whistle with glee. Does he not notice that each year his favorite tree stands more bare and scarred? That it weeps great rivers of fragrant resin and groans and creaks at the slightest spring breeze? Or is this his reason for returning, that the tree could not survive the winter without the conviction that the mockingbird would return? to sing of regeneration to newly forming branches and to bring gladness where once there was only despair. This poem's entitled Morning Star. It's dedicated to my friend Norbert Kropf, who's a poet. On Long Island, in the quietude of morning, a man rises from his bed then tiptoes sock-footed down the stairs, avoiding the squeaky one halfway down. He alone is awake. His son sleeps clutching the violin that still resonates with something Russian and passionate. His wife dreams always of cypress trees, heavy with Spanish moss and the bayou's pungent hum. He opens the back door and pulls on his boots, remembering his mother who needed him too much his father distanced by despair. He considers his footprints solitary in the snow and wonders how it came to be this way, that poems wake him in the night and drive him out the door when Venus rules the sky, early, early before first light, to find redemption in the rhythm of the shovel and in the blisters on his hands. Midwinter. <clears throat> Yellow apples turning wrinkly brown in the bowl invite visions of August persimmons, frost-bitten mahogany orbs ripening near the chicken coop at Grandpa's farm. Summer demands so much of us, the glare, the heat, the danger. Midwinter settles in like a familiar hand on the back of the neck. The early darkness bids us consider that the way we recognize the sweetness of comfort is that our tongues remember the bitterness of sorrow. This one's for the musicians in the audience and performing, and for the ones that I have the good fortune to be a part of their family. The music, the boys. 
On any given night, it might be Billy testifying about strange fruit channeled through Charlie's strong fingers taming the steel strings of an electric guitar. Or maybe it is the hour of piano voices like angels because Sam is in the music room mastering Randy Newman's cynical god chords. Or if the smoky fog has wrapped around a violin, the longings of some Irish kid with a devilish name come streaking down the hall and right smack dab into my heart. And sometimes, on nights when the planets have aligned and the stars rise early to join the invitation-only audience, their father sings while they play. And there is nothing, nothing more moving in its harmony, more perfect in its tune. Um, as you can probably tell, this is a book of family poems with photographs. And, um, this last poem I'm going to read for you is the one that people ask for most often. And the, the stories in here are true. My great-great-grandmother writes the perfect poem. Mary Ellen stands outside the Busy Bee Cafe a corrugated metal building with a hand-painted open sign, its shabbiness evident in the harsh light. Her left thumb is hooked over her pocket, her tiny wire glasses almost invisible in the photograph taken in Tonopah, Nevada. It was the late 30s and the town was dying. Silver mine dust settled everywhere on cafe tables and on windowsills and inside her faded bedroom. When Mary Ellen was 30, her husband and two sons died, poisoned with some unknown substance while camped in a lovely clearing at the side of the road. Found with their faces blue and their coffee cups half empty, the banked coals still warm from the night before. When she recovered, she remarried, and her new husband took her out to Tonopah. Maybe her bruised heart found a home in the desert that sparse land with no trees and few rivers, so different from lush North Texas. She wrote poetry there, at a red-checked, oilcloth-covered table in the Busy Bee Cafe, whenever she wasn't serving the dwindling stream of customers or bussing worn-out tables or washing chipped dishes. She mailed her poems to the Christian Science Monitor, and they published more than one delicate, intricate Victorian verse rhymed and metered. But I believe her perfect poem is written on the back of the Busy Bee photograph where, despite the sorrows of her life and the rusting facade, she wrote, this is where I feed the hungry. Thank you.